some of the edge of, off of that with energy efficiency, but you're you're probably not going to make more than a you know say a 15 or 20 percent contribution to the solution. Now that's a big solution, uh, but it's not the entire solution. So I guess I would amend David's comments by broadening the the arsenal, if you will, of weapons that we need to attack global warming to include things like carbon capture and storage, which which actually has been demonstrated at commercial scale. There's a plan. Uh, in Saskatchewan that just opened this wall that demonstrates that, that process. Nuclear energy, which is not often uh, popular among environmentalists, I think is something that, that is, needs to be looked at as part of the solution set. I think if we put all these things together, I would go beyond renewable energy and you know, energy efficiency, which are, which are very useful, but I think not sufficient. If you put all of that together and you really work on getting the cost down and the effectiveness up, I think we have a serious shot at this and maybe avoiding some of the more scary kinds of um, geoengineering things that folks are talking about. David Miller, what's the World Wildlife Fund's view of um, nuclear energy? Um, we're concerned about nuclear energy because nobody has solved the problem of what you do with the spent fuel, which essentially pollutes forever and is very high risk to, to human health and the health of nature. Plus, uh, this probably isn't part of our position, but it's incredibly expensive. Uh, nuclear energy cost overruns uh, essentially bankrupted Ontario Hydro and almost the province of Ontario. So those are two huge obstacles that, that we haven't come to grips with. Um, but I actually don't think that's the problem. I, I think the problem, I'm going back to the point I made earlier, but the problem we're facing is a lack of action because of criticisms of known solutions. Clean energy, whether it's all the solution or a big part of it, is clearly really important that we need to move faster and at scale. How do we do that? What, where's the, where, where's the, the, the thing that will move us forward faster? Is that a government role? What is that? Is that a corporate role? There is some government role. You know, if you, if you look at the investments in Canada today in clean energy, most of the investments are coming from Germany and Japan in Canada, very, very interestingly, except for hydro. I think uh, there's some government policy roles. Um, uh, promoting a smart grid, for example, as the council, uh, as, as was recently determined in a scientific study, very, very important to having uh, clean energy reduction. Um, things like Ontario's feed-in tariff, which is a subsidy for clean energy, uh, but is a way of counteracting the fact that the pollution generated by coal and oil and natural gas-fired plants is, is treated as free, and all the health impacts of that and the, the uh, environmental impact are treated as free very important. So those kind of governmental strategies matter, um, and we look to, to business and others for continuing to bring the cost down. That innovation is happening today, and there's innovation in the storage which helps deal with the inter intermittency problem. So we combine you know, private actions and public actions, you can get a very positive result, and that's what we see in Germany. Huge advances there, partly probably strategically for Germany, they don't want to have to buy oil from the Middle East, but they very important advances in one of the biggest industrial economies in the world, if not the biggest. And if Germany can do it, Canada certainly can. So he's still pessimistic. He's still optimistic. Armin Cohen, after what the Google scientists have said, are you optimistic still? Yeah, I am. And I, I mean, I would agree with David that the government role is really to push uh, innovation across um, across all these platforms. Uh, and I think that's what the Google authors were saying: is we need, you know, we need to really. Uh, push to get costs down. Where I would be, again, offer a friendly amendment to David's point is that I think we need to be innovating across all technologies. I personally don't want to bet the planet that we're going to get there on wind and solar and energy efficiency alone. I, I think there are numerous studies that suggest that Germany, despite its successes, I think is, is already stumbling um, to, in, towards its goal. Now, it's not to say they won't get a lot. So I would argue that the government role in, would have to include um, things like carbon capture and storage um, and, you know, better Okay. Um, just, but we're, we're going to have to leave it there. We're out of time, but thank you both for being part of this discussion. Thanks very much, Anna Marie. Um, that, that's David Miller, President and CEO of the World Wildlife Fund Canada. He's in Toronto. Armin Cohen heads the Clean Air Task Force in Boston. He was in our Washington studio. That's all the time we have for the current review. I'm Anna Maria Tremonti. Thanks for listening. This is CBC Radio 1, 91.5 FM in Ottawa. Canada lives here. Fleetwood Mac has been one of the most exciting musical acts of the past five decades. Things were often just as lively backstage. Band leader Mick Fleetwood talks about his band's years of rock and roll chaos and excess 
and his new autobiography, Play Yard. Mick Fleetwood, Thursday on Q at 10 a.m. and 10 p.m., 10.30 in Newfoundland. The news is next, followed by Ideas with Paul Kennedy. Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance has been called the most widely read book of philosophy ever written. Forty years after its publication, we revisit an extraordinary interview with author Robert Persig on Ideas. This is CBC News. Good evening, I'm Rafi Vigo. Alberta Premier Jim Prentice has met with his Quebec counterpart, Philippe Couillard, to push the benefits of an Energy East pipeline. Two of Alberta's biggest pipeline projects have stalled, one heading west to British Columbia and one heading into the United States. And as Ryan Hicks reports, a lot is riding on Prentice's visit to Quebec. He's pitching billions of dollars for the Quebec economy if Quebec allows the Energy East pipeline to move forward here. He's also pitching economic benefits for the municipalities along the pipeline's route, benefits like jobs, and he also says it's a safer way to transport oil than rail, but this could not have come at a more awkward time. A national committee that oversees wildlife protection classified the beluga whale as endangered. Why is this important? Because the Trans Canada has proposed drilling in, in an area of the St. Lawrence River that is a breeding ground for the beluga whale. Also, two-thirds of Quebecers, according to one poll, oppose this pipeline. So this visit isn't just about wooing Philippe Couillard, it's also about wooing Quebecers. The CBC's Ryan Hicks in Montreal. A new study says employment in the green energy sector has now surpassed that in the oil sands. The climate think tank Clean Energy Canada says just as the oil and gas industries begin to worry that low oil prices could hurt growth, green employment is moving. Don Pettis reports. Here at the Toronto waterfront, the Port Authority is constructing a controversial tunnel to a controversial downtown airport. According to the vice president of green energy company Bullfrog Power, Anthony Santelli, the energy this tunnel will use is anything but controversial. The Toronto Port Authority is greening all its electricity for the current facilities. A new report out today says Bullfrog Power is only one example of a Canada-wide trend. According to Baron Smith from Green Energy Canada, the group found more money was being invested in green power than in fishing, forestry, and agriculture, creating 23,000 jobs. That's when they ran across a surprising statistic. We went to, uh, to the Oil Sands Human Resources Council and found that their number for direct jobs in the oil sands was just over 22,000. So there's slightly more direct jobs than there are in the oil sands. Don Pettis, CBC News, Toronto. Environmentalists and First Nations in the Yukon are celebrating a ruling from the Territory Supreme Court. Justice Ron Peel struck down the government's development plans for 80% of a region called the Peel Watershed. Peel says the government failed to respect the planning process agreed to with First Nations. Yukon's Conservation Society calls it a historic decision that upholds the honor and integrity of land claims agreements. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu fired two high-profile members of his coalition cabinet today. That most likely means an election two years ahead of schedule that could lead to a significant shift in Israel's political landscape. The CBC's Middle East correspondent Sasha Petrasek explains. If you listen to the opposition, it's because he wants to make sure that he can continue on as Prime Minister, that he doesn't really like this arrangement now where he has to share power. And there's a lot of talk here that, that, that really, if another election were to be held, as it looks likely in the next few months, because that's how the schedule works here, that the Knesset would end up being more to the right and more fragmented than it is now. So uh, even though he, Benjamin Netanyahu, is most likely to remain prime minister, the actual shape of the government is likely to change significantly here. CBC's Middle East correspondent Sasha Petrasek in Jerusalem. It appears that Gordy Howe did not suffer another stroke, as earlier believed. He is thought to be suffering from dehydration and fatigue, and is expected to be discharged from a hospital in Texas tomorrow. The hockey legend has suffered two strokes in the past two months. And that's the news to this hour from CBC Radio.
time now to take a look at the forecast for Ottawa tonight. Mainly cloudy, periods of snow beginning this evening with a risk of freezing rain overnight and temperature rising to zero by morning. For Wednesday, periods of snow changing to periods of rain or wet snow in the morning. Then a few flurries in the afternoon with a risk of freezing rain early in the morning and a high of plus three. And for Wednesday night, cloudy with a 30% chance of flurries in the evening and a low of minus nine. You see things vacationing on a motorcycle in a way that is completely different.